<laughs> thank no, you not yet enough. Yeah, Good. thank you a lot for introduction, and congratulations, Alessio, again. Thank and you. Uh, I also thank uh, the organizers. Also, I mean, especially Robert McCann, uh, I used to be my uh, postdoc supervisor, and like twelve years ago, and he introduced me to uh, this beautiful world of optimal transport. Also to Alessio and. I, I have been very lucky to uh, to meet these very wonderful people in this uh, area. Okay. Also, I mean, I have these uh, fantastic collaborators, of course, Nasib Kusu uh, at UBC and Aaron Palmer. He's a postdoc at UBC. Also, uh, recently in one game at UCLA. Okay. Oops. Okay. I I talk about uh, uh, basically two two uh, works on uh, Brownian stopping uh, optimal transport. So one for fixed target, the other one free target. And the fixed target case is a joint work with uh, Gusuf and Palmo and free target case is a joint work with uh, Inmon Kim. But that free target case is still work in progress. We are still writing the paper. Uh, so uh, you should take uh, what I say for the free target case with grain of salt. Okay. The main point I'd like to present is that optimal transport, when it coupled with granular motion stopping time, has a fundamental connection to free boundary problems in um, PDEs, uh, like the heat equation. Okay. So here is the outline. So I will talk about granular motion, stopping time, and the optimal stopping time problem. And I talk about, uh, let's say, duality and dynamic programming and Euler formulation. And also in the free target case, uh, I talk. So the problem uh, is free target, but with a density constraint. There is a density constraint, and then under that we have monotonicity, which uh, and also saturation. I will explain those, and then these will connect to the the, the classical Stefan problem in in in, in like uh, water freezing and ice melting. Okay. So what is Brownian motion? Brownian motion is the limit of a random walk in Rn. Okay, if you just uh, uh, take the limit of random walk uh, uh, to the small, smaller and smaller scale, then you will get this uh, random pass, continuous passes uh, called Brownian motion. And there is this notion of stopping time. This is just a, 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 a random time. So it's a time for each Brownian pass that you know uh, when to stop. For example, uh, so in this picture, you have this like a, a domain. So you brown your motion starts from here, and then you may uh, hit this wall, this boundary. Then you, you can stop. So stopping times uh, often are associated with the the, uh, the the boundary of certain domain called the barrier. Okay. So when it hits the barrier, it stops. And there are of course many other. Uh, uh, ways of uh, defining, uh, finding stopping and times, but the typical ones are hitting times, hitting to a barrier. Okay. And here is the, the classical problem in probability called the score problem. It's like, okay, so we have Brownian motion and stopping time. So then we can start uh, the Brownian motion from some initial distribution, let's say mu. And suppose you, you want to uh, uh, achieve some certain target distributions, let's say new, by uh, following the Brownian path and by stopping at some appropriate time. So the, the question is how to find such a stopping time that realize the target distribution new, okay? And of course, the existence of such a stopping time is, is highly non-trivial. This is like a, a famous problem in probability. And we need a condition on the uh, initial and target measure to have such a stopping time. Like uh, if, if you want to uh, have the expected value of the stopping time is finite. Okay, the condition is this. The, the mu and nu should be in subharmonic order. Namely for each subharmonic function, uh, C, you, have, uh, you, you need to have this uh, uh, inequality between the, these two integrals with mu and with, with nu. Okay, it simply, uh, it roughly means the, the target measure nu has to be more spread out than the initial measure mu, which is a reasonable assumption because Brownian motion over time spread the mass. 
And it is necessary assumption to have such a, a stopping time tau. So here, here is some uh, names. So Skoro started this problem and there's a famous solution to this problem by Root and then Roast and then other people, Ajemayor, Pekins and Obrush. And the connection of this uh, Skoro problem to optimal transport, I believe started with the work of Hobson in, in UK and then uh, ultimately by Beagle, Bob Cox and Hussman in, uh, in 2013 where they actually use the optimal transport to unify all the previous regions about the, 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 the solution to the uh, uh, score of the problem. And many people are working in, direct, in this direction, especially people from mass finance. Okay, then we consider the, the so-called optimal, uh, optimal score of the problem. What is it? So among all these uh, solutions to score of the problem, we may consider those ones that minimize a certain cost, okay? We can define a cost over stopping time. I believe you see my cursor, right? Yes. Okay, good. Actually, so, I have a question about the earlier statement about the subharmonic order condition. Yes. So the subharmonic order is, you say it's uh, sufficient for a stopping time to exist. Um, if the measures necessary. are actually- it's, it's Necessary, but also sufficient. Necessary and sufficient. And if the if the measures are actually in convex order, does that what additional thing does that tell you about the stopping time? Is that known? I don't think so. Yeah, good question. Right. Thanks. So, but uh, convex order uh, is not a is not a, the stronger condition than subharmonic. Subharmonic order is stronger. Uh, I see. I see. Okay, it's a weaker condition. I yeah. see. So, convex order is not enough to guarantee existence of a stopping exactly. time. Okay, thanks. So you can consider uh, the, uh, the cost associated with starting time like, like this, like a Lagrangian type cost. You follow the Brownian path and you integrate a certain uh, function L and you st stop that integral at the starting time. Then this is for each Brownian path. So you take the expected value. Then you get the, the cost for your whole Brownian path starting from mu, but ending at nu, okay? You can also consider other types of cost, like this distance between the initial location and the final location of the Brownian pass. Then you take the expected value, then it, that will give you a cost. So this is like distance cost in, in user optimal transport. This is like a Lagrangian cost in the user, user optimal transport. But you do this with the, the stopping time, and you want to find the optimal one uh, under this condition that you realize the initial measure and target, target measure that are given, okay? And of course, uh, questions about existence, okay, do the optimal uh, uh, stopping times exist? Uh, is there any uniqueness? Uh, is there any structure of that, that optimal solution? In particular, is there any kind of extremal structure that we can see uh, from uh, the shape of the, the, how the mass is uh, spread? Because Brownian motion spread the mass, then maybe understanding the shape of how the, uh, the Brownian path spread the mass can be interesting. And of course, I mean, this uh, optimal score of the problem is a, is a variant of optimal transfer problem. Yeah, optimal transfer problem. Now with this additional constraint that the mass has to follow the Brownian path. That is an additional condition, but without that condition, it's just a usual optimal transfer problem, okay? With certain type of cost, all right? And of course, there are many people uh, working in optimal transport, uh, many people in the audience, and I just wanted to uh, uh, say that we now have a one uh, Nobel Prize uh, winner in this area and two Fields medalists. Maybe we need one more Nobel Prize, I don't know. Okay. Two months. And- Koopmans. 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 shared the Nobel Prize with Koopmans. So Koopmans worked out the discrete case, the duality in the discrete case. Oh, I see, so we have two Nobel Prize at the same year. <laughs> So we need uh, another uh, year of Nobel Prize. Okay. And also the optimal scroll problem is a special case of Martingale optimal transport. So Martingale optimal transport is it's also a variant of optimal transport where you have this Martingale condition, uh, additional constraint that the mass 
has to follow a, a martingale uh, process or martingale transport. Okay, and martingale uh, transport is a special, uh, sorry, Brownian motion is a special case of martingale. Okay, I, I'm not uh, going to talk about what martingale is, but anyways, the point is that there are many people working in this direction, including the people in this slide. Okay. So it's not, it's not a very small area. There are many people working in the uh, related problems, especially people from mass finance. Okay, now let's focus on optimal scroll problem with this uh, given uh, source and target measure mu and nu. And from now on, for simplicity, I'll just uh, focus on the case when this mu and nu are uh, compactly supported in Rn. And also uh, I will, uh, implicitly assume that mu is absolutely continuous with respect to the back measure. Okay, to discuss the optimal scroll problem, maybe the one of the first step is to understand this uh, randomized stopping time. So, okay, well, let's start with stopping time. What is stopping time? One can view stopping time as a measure of a function over the space of passes. Given a pass, we have the time. And this is like, uh, it has to satisfy certain uh, measurability with, with respect to the filtered sigma algebra for, for the uh, stochastic process. This is, but anyways, it's a measurable function, simply speaking. Okay, then what is a randomized stopping time? So instead of uh, considering this measurable function, you can consider um, a priority measure on this uh, product space between the space of passes and the time. Okay. And what's the relation between the stopping time and randomized stopping time? The stopping time is like a special case of randomized stopping time where the randomized stopping time is concentrated on certain graph of a, a function. So, so randomized stopping time in the stopping time context is nothing but a Dirac mass uh, at each uh, omega on this graph. This is very similar. Okay, so let me let me continue. So, is there any question about the randomized stopping time? So, is it an analogous to the uh, Kanarovich problem? When you look at randomized stopping times, is it a linear uh, maximization that becomes non-linear in the non-randomized case? Exactly. So that's this. Uh, that's uh, that's the, the like uh, the starting point of this work of Vigelbach, Cox, and Hussmann. This randomized stopping time is like a, it gives a major major value solution to the to the optimization problem. So it's like the, the same same as the control of relaxation of optimal transport problem. Okay, so first of all, the set of randomized stopping times is non-empty if mu and nu are in subordinate order, and then the space of randomized stopping time is a space of pro probability measures. Anyways, so it has the the, the weak star compactness. So the space of randomized time times is compact. And then the cost, I mean, you can consider the lower semi-continuous cost um, from in many contexts. So those costs should have optimal randomized starting times. So this way we can easily find the, the optimal solution, but in a weak sense, because it's a relaxed solution. Because instead of the, uh, the usual starting time, we get the randomized starting time as our optimal solution, okay? It's like the, the Kantorovich solution versus Mungji solution in optimal transport. And then the question is, okay, then when the Kantorovich solution we got uh, from this relaxation will, be, will become the actual solution giving the, the, the actual stopping time, not just randomized stopping time. Okay, that's the question. And is there any associated structure to it? So Bigova, Cox and Hussman found the solution to this problem by uh, developing certain variational tools uh, for comparing uh, passes in the uh, different passes, okay, uh, with respect to the cost. Okay, they call this uh, variational tool monotonicity principle. Okay, so they got not only uh, the solution to finding the, the optimal uh, stopping time, not just randomized, okay, for this type of cost, but also they found that those stopping times given optimally are heating times to a certain barrier. So you have certain barrier here in the space time, okay? And the Brownian motion moves. So 
along the time, so time increase, the Brownian motion uh, move forward, okay? And then it hits the barrier, then it stops. So that's the optimal stopping time when the barrier is given by, I mean, is determined by the source and target measure in a certain way, okay? So that's what they found. And, and in fact, all the previous solutions of uh, score of the problem, finding the, the stopping time, realizing the initial uh, source, initial measure and the target measure are given in this way. So there is an associated barrier. And then the score of problem solution is the heating time to, to that, to those barriers, okay? And there are certain, uh, works in the literature, uh, especially in 1D, that connects this optimal starting time problem with obstacle problems of the heat equation, okay? Like in this work. But they, their work are mainly focused in 1D. And then in, in the work with uh, Kusuk and Palmer, we, we could uh, kind of do the, the similar things in general dimensions, okay? That's the point of this paper. So first of all, we can solve the dual problem associated to the, the original problem, okay? And then how do you find, uh, solve the dual problem? We develop some analytical or PD tools, okay? And then we find the dual problem and the, the, the solution to the dual problem, the dual optimal solution determines the barrier in the previous picture, okay? So in this Lagrangian type cost, the barrier, is a set in the space time and it is determined by the optimal dual solution. And this type, like a uh, kind of distance type cost, the barrier is not a set in the space time, but it's a set in the, the product space of Rn with itself and is still determined by the optimal dual solution. Okay. So in this uh, Lagrangian type cost, the barrier looks like this. And also it may look like this here or this here, uh, depending on, for example, when the Lagrangian is strictly increasing over time, then the barrier is like this uh, forward barrier and Brownian motion hits the barrier from below. And if the uh, Lagrangian is uh, strictly decreasing, then the barrier is like this backward barrier and the Brownian motion hits the barrier from above. So this case is so the root solution, the first solution to the score, uh, the score problem, and then this case is row solution, and the next uh, case. And in okay, so by the way, I call this cost Markovian cost. Why, why the name? It's because this cost, if you, for example, you are at, at a given time, let's say t, and you want to, you 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 consider how much as you move, how much the cost will increase. And the increment of the cost depends on what you do from now on, okay? It does not depend on what you did in the past. That's Markovia. But if you consider this cost over here, how much you increase the cost depends not only on how you do from now on, but also it depends on what you did in the past because this initial uh, location of your uh, Brownian path always matter for this cost, okay? So this, this cost depends on, on the initial point. So because of that, the corresponding barriers, I mean, will depend on, in principle, each point you start with. So at each point X, you have a corresponding barrier, let's say Rx, okay? That depends on X, where you start this granular motion at this location, then it stops when it hits the barrier. And if you put such a type of barrier in the space-time uh, context, then this is a barrier in the space-time context that at, at X, you start a Brownian motion, it stops when it hit this infinite wall. So it's like you have an infinite wall in the, in the, in the space-time, okay? It's like a vertical uh, uh, piece. It's con in contrast to this like uh, kind of the, this, uh, uh, this wall, which has either upper bound or lower bound. And here in this shape, there's no upper bound and lower bound in time. But it, but the wall depends on X. Yes, the wall depends on X. That's the point of this non-Markovian cost. Okay, the, 
The important tool for us is, of course, I said duality. So what is duality in this context? So, so the primary problem, our original problem is about uh, stopping times, or more generally, uh, it's about probability measures, okay, in the uh, space of passes, okay? Because randomized stopping times are probability measures. And in, in duality, uh, those problems with um, measures can be translated into other problems in functions. So initially we had minimization problem for measures, but now we can consider the maximization problem for functions, okay? And then the, the functional for this maximization problem is, is given in this way, okay? You have kind of pair psi and j psi, and j psi is determined by psi, and psi is in this, uh, uh, the initial function space we consider is just raw semi-continuous functions, okay? And then how do you determine this j psi? Uh, this j psi, is, uh, if you are familiar with optimal transport, is, is like a C transform of psi, okay? But what is j psi in our context? So j psi, you take psi minus the cost in, in both Markovian and non-Markovian uh, case, and you consider all the uh, possible randomized stopping time starting from each point y, okay? And you take the expected value. And then you take the supremum of all the such possible ran uh, randomized stopping times, okay? So that supremum gives us this pair, this j psi, okay? And then the dual, dual problem is with this psi and j psi given in, given in this way. And, and so this is supposed to be analogous to the C transform from the exactly. alpha yeah. context. But as you see, this is not symmetric. I mean, psi determines J psi, but J psi, I mean, going back is, you know, Brownian motion is not uh, Unreversible. back and forth. Okay. And this J psi, given in that way, has very nice analytical properties. So this is called dynamic program principle. If you uh, define a function like that, it solves certain uh, PDE problem. So this is, this is like a PDE, but it's obstacle problem. You have this obstacle or J minus psi or J minus psi plus C, okay? Where the function uh, J is above that obstacle, but it, but when, so it touches the obstacle, but when it does not touch the obstacle, it should solve this uh, nice PDEs. Just, Education or Laplace equation. Yeah, uh, it looks like a Schrodinger equation, no? Or I mean, well, it's, it's pretty close to a Schrodinger equation. I mean, it has this potential. It's so this is backward heat equation. This is a Laplace equation. Okay. Okay. Then how do you get the dual uh, attainment? How do you find the dual optimal solution? Just one remark is that why? So here. I mean, in the usual optimal transport, uh, with the usual course, when the course is like ellipsis uh, functions, then finding the dual optimal solution is kind of a piece of cake. I mean, because the, the class of dual functions in the usual optimal transport with uh, ellipsis course are again ellipsis. So we consider that the space of ellipsis functions, which is compact. So your compactness, so finding the optimal solution is, is easy. But in this case, such a compactness is not apparent because, I mean, our functions are just raw semi-continuous and then it's not apparent how do you get uh, some kind of uh, compactness in the function space. So that's why in, in this uh, uh, optimal transport with this additional probabilistic cost, solving the dual problem is not always easy. In fact, in the Martingale transport case, which is more general than the, the, the Brownian uh, motion case, we do not know how to solve the, the, the corresponding dual problem in general, okay? But in this case of, of Brownian stopping, the optimal score we are able to solve the, the dual problem. So that's the, the result uh, with the Gusevian primer. So the point is that we can reduce this non-compact function space to a compact function space, okay? Satisfying certain conditions and there's so the, the key point was to find such a reduction. So we found certain uh, uh, normalization process to make uh, 
let's say the maximization sequence of uh, row semi-continuous functions to a maximization sequence of solar time functions. So then you get, uh, 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 because of some compactness of the functions, so our function space is a subset of this solar space. And because of the compactness, we can find uh, the optimal one. Okay, I, I, but we need some we need some conditions like uh, either the L is bounded or the Laplace and C is bounded. Okay. Okay. Then we we found the dual optimal solution, right? And then we can consider this barrier uh, determined by the dual optimal solution. How how that barrier is uh, uh, determined? How is it defined? So we have this J psi star given by psi star, and, and J psi star is above psi star, okay? If you remember the previous uh, slide here, so this one has to be non-negative, the same for this. So the, the barrier is a set where J psi star touches, J psi star touches the obstacle. So that's this red one here, or this red one in this picture here, is what uh, the, the barrier is, okay? So in the Markovian case, such a barrier is a set in the space time. So at each X, you have this set of times, or at each time, you have this set of points. And in the Markovian case, the barrier set is a, is a set in the product space of Rn, Rn times Rn. So at each X, you have this set of uh, points in our end, and we have uh, we, you already see have seen this uh, this picture, right? At each checks we have kind of this vertical wall uh, as our barrier. So Markovian case and non Markovian case has this type of difference. In Markovian case, the barrier is just one set in the space time. So at each checks here, you just follow the gradient path and then you stop when it hits this uh, barrier, but the same barrier for any other initial point X. In the non-Markovian case, such a barrier depends on your initial point. And under these conditions that in Markovian case, the Lagrangian function is strictly increasing or decreasing in time, or in the Markovian case, the cost is either the distance or Riemannian distance or, or more general, there is some, some more general notion for such a, uh, uh, such a cost. But then under such conditions, we can show that actually the optimal stopping time is a heating time to the barrier. So previously we found this barrier, but given this barrier, it's not, not at all obvious that whether the optimal stopping time should be the heating time of the barrier. It is obvious once you find such a barrier uh, uh, defined in this way, the optimal stopping time stops inside the barrier, but it's not obvious that it should immediately stop when it meets the barrier. So that's uh, the context of this theorem that actually the optimal stopping time is a heating time. So when you hit the barrier, you immediately stop for optimality. And because of this property, barrier determines the, the optimal stopping time uniquely and actually the, the barrier itself is uniquely determined. So optimal starting time has to be unique. And deterministic. I wouldn't call it deterministic, but it's determined by the barrier, but for each uh, random pass. I mean, but it's a no longer a randomized stopping time, right? This is, yeah, this is, it is uh, not randomized. It's non -randomized. It's a pure stopping time. It's because you, you know exactly the time when you hit the barrier. Okay. And before we, uh, we close this part one, let me just uh, make a remark about this so-called Eulerian formulation. Uh, so of course, I mean, we are talking about Brownian motion, so it should be related to heat equation. So what is the corresponding PD formulation? So we have this flow of mass, uh, eta, solving this heat equation with certain source, source term because as you move the, the flow, you have to uh, lose the mass because uh, you have to realize the target measure by dropping some mass, okay? That's why you have this term rho. This is like a, the, the time rate 
uh, of how much you uh, you drop the mass. So if you integrate this rate row, then you should get the, the target measure. Okay, and and such a flow has this corresponding cost. So you can uh, reformulate the previous problem as the, this minimization problem for, for this uh, mass flow eta, okay, with this Lagrange type cost. And then from our result, previous results, we see that this mass flow starts from uh, Rn and then it moves in the space time, but it, it does not go beyond this barrier. So you will see later uh, uh, more, but this, this just suggests that we are the handling kind of free boundary problem of this heat equation, right? Okay, so this closed part one, and now let's uh, start part two. Sorry, what was the last, the, what was the last two equations there, the expectations? What's G, G is a test function? Uh, this, I think this just simply says, uh, this equation basically happens inside this uh, outside of area. And, and okay, so I'm, I'm bad at reading the, 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 the equations, but the, the point is the value and the actual stopping happens only on the boundary. Maybe it is not apparent in this, uh, it's not shown in this PD, but I'm um, in this equation, but and you said that, that's, that's the point. The actual stopping occurs this row occurs only along this uh, boundary. Okay. All right, so let's move on this part two. So previously in, in part one, we considered a problem where the target measure nu was fixed, was given. But now we free up that, that condition. So now our target can be free, but we have this other condition that the target measure has to satisfy certain upper bound uh, condition. Okay, so this is John. Uh, a pro it's a work in progress with uh, in one game. Okay, so what I'm going to say uh, from now on is not completely finished because we are still writing the paper. So you should you should take my words with grain of salt. Okay. Okay, what's the problem? So we we are given some function f, which will give us an upper bound for the target measure new okay so target measure new is free but we have this condition that that has to be bounded by f so f gives us the upper bound of the density of the target measure okay and then with this additional condition we just consider this minimization problem okay all right so this is a free target version of our previous problem. But one can also see this as like a stochastic version of this non-stochastic case of this optimal transfer problem with uh, the density upper bound constraint as developed by uh, especially Santambrogio, but this is work of De Pilipis, Mesa, Ross, and Santambrogio and Berichkov in, in 15. Okay, so they wrote this beautiful paper, BBS made in optimal transportation that considers such a problem. So you can view this as also the stochastic version of this problem, okay? And there are some similarities because uh, between our results and their results because of this. And from now on, we focus on the Markovian case, okay? The cost is given by this Markovian type cost. So the corresponding barrier, if uh, you solve the, the problem will be a set in the space time. Okay. Okay. Of course, the existence is the most important uh, question in this uh, for this problem, and it is easy if your Density con upper bound constant F is compactly supported. Then everything should stay inside the support of F. So we have immediate compactness of the problem. So you can find the optimal solution, okay? Then after you find the optimal solution with this uh, target, new star, which is determined by this minimization problem, okay? Then you can use the, the previous three just for, with a fixed target then you get dual attainment for such a mu and nu star, 
and the barrier heating time and order and formulation and so on and so forth. Okay. So it's easy when the support of this upper bound constant is compact. But of course, it's not, not in general uh, that simple when the support of F is not compact. For example, this is the actually the model case uh, we are considering when the F is just constant okay, over the whole space. Then we do not have uh, immediate compactness because a priori is it might be possible that the mass in the, in the, in the optimize, optimizing sequence may escape to infinity, okay? Now, how can, how can you handle that, okay? So first, we consider the uh, compact support case, which is easy, and then we try to take the limit, but of course, we have to uh, control how the each optimal solution with compact support we behave as we take the, the, the limit when we uh, increase the support of F to a bigger and bigger set. And we need a certain tool, which is uh, called monotonicity and saturation, okay? So fortunately, we now have such a tool and we could handle even this case too, okay? But this case is maybe the most important case, F is constant, you will see why. Okay, by the way, so we have two cases to consider, the D1 and D2. D1 is a case when the Lagrangian is strictly increasing over time, and D2 is, a uh, is strictly decreasing over time. So we have these two different types of barrier. So in this D1 type, when you have, this, the, the, when you have the, the target new, the optimal barrier is like this forward barrier. So, so you, your Brownian motion stops, uh, hits the barrier from below, and D2 type case, your Brownian motion hits the barrier from above, okay? And for this forward type and backward type barrier, you can consider uh, this function as X defining uh, the barrier. So X, X is for each X here, you consider this distance, that's SX, the height of this uh, barrier. So at each, each X here, this height is SX in D2 case. And over here, SX is zero, okay? So, and the tau star is infimum over all, actually, I, I forgot to uh, put positive T, positive T, which is, is bigger than, uh, uh, where, where the, the Brownian motion um, gives the, the big, uh, smaller value than the time for S. So it's simply, the tau star is the heating time to the barrier, okay? So here the important fo uh, formula is this, Sx is a defining function of the barrier and we use that definition from now. Okay, so what is the monotonicity uh, we are talking about? Okay, so this is a free target problem, but for the source, I mean, we, we do not necessarily need to consider only probability measures. You can consider uh, any, any measures, mu, so as long as the target measure is the same mass and subarmory order, you can consider uh, the, the, the stopping, Brownian stopping connecting those two, okay? So suppose you have two measures, mu one and mu two as your initial measure, but they are in order. Mu one is less than mu two, okay? And then you consider this uh, free target problem with the upper bound constraint where F is given. F is the same for mu one and mu two given, okay? Then you solve this optimization problem, you get the optimal heating time and uh, optimal stopping time tau i. Okay, under this assumption that either D1 or D2, the, the optimal solution, the optimal stopping time and the, the corresponding the target distributions have the same order as before, okay? So this is monotonicity. So here this, this order is pointwise order. If you just uh, believe uh, mu1 and mu2 have the, the just continuous uh, function as density, then th those functions have this order. Okay? Then you have the same order in the target. Okay? And also same order for the, the stopping time. The Brownian passes for, for mu1 stops earlier than the Brownian passes uh, for mu2. Okay? So that's the monotonicity. 
And what is the behind the scene for this monotonicity? It's a monotonicity of the barrier. So in D1 case, the barrier for uh, mu1 is smaller than the barrier for mu2. So S1 is below S2. So the corresponding heating time is, is uh, smaller than the corresponding heating time to S2. The similarly in the D2 case, the corresponding heating time to S1 is smaller than the corresponding heating time to S2. Because to hit S2, you first hit, need to hit S1 okay, to go inside here. Okay. So this monotonicity uh, of the barrier uh, is the, what is, uh, what gives this, uh, this monotonicity for the starting time and also the, the, the target distributions. And this monotonicity is, uh, is kind of simple statement, but it's, it's kind of very powerful because it will give us some nice result like the following. So now we do not assume that mu and mu2 are ordered. Just they are just mu and mu and mu2. Okay. Okay, then on the D1 and D2, we can say, okay, the difference in the L1 difference in the optimal target mu and mu1 and mu2 is controlled by the L1 difference between mu initial measure mu and mu2. Using the previous monotonicity, you can actually show this L1 contraction result. And this all immediately gives us the uniqueness of the optimal solution. And what is less obvious is this. When F is constant, you can actually differentiate this inequality, okay? Translating the, the initial measure uh, mu1 and you differentiate, then you get this BB estimate. So you get some, some kind of solar left type regularity for the target measure when you have that solar left regularity for the, the initial measure. Okay. So the monotonicity, uh, even though it's a simple statement, it's kind of powerful to get even the analytical properties of the, the optimal solution. Okay, another, another important tool for us is the saturation. It says the following. So in that optimization problem, when you start with mu looking like this, okay, and the F is our uh, density upper bound. Okay, then of course mass, Brownian motion um, moves the mass from mu, but, but there is certain portion of this mu which does not move at all in the optimal solution. So there is a certain region where Brownian motion stops immediately. It does not move. So there's, so, so you have some kind of inactive region F and active region E. Active region is where actually the Brownian motion happens and inactive region is where nothing happens. Just the mass stays. So that's the D1 case. And D, D2 case is also similar that in this case, you consider this mu and it's the common mass between mu and this uh, density upper bound, that's F wedge mu. And this common mass does not move at all under the Brownian, uh, optimal Brownian motion. So this common mass just stays put and you do the, 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 the transport only with this remaining mass, this red part. That's one thing. Another thing is that for those uh, active uh, mass, when they move, and they, they make the target measure which saturate the constraint in the active region, okay? So in the active region, the constraint F is saturated. The density of the target measure in the active region is equal to the upper bound, okay? In both D1 and D2 case. Okay, so that's the saturation, okay. So in fact, uh, uh, the paper uh, by uh, Santambrogio, uh, Pipilipis, uh, Messarius, and Bechkov have, has a similar, a similar result, like a saturation. But this is kind of a probabilistic counterpart of it. Okay. So if you consider the saturation, in more dynamic point of view uh, over time, the picture looks like this. Okay, you have the initial measure. 
in both D1 and this case, you, 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 you track the picture as time changes, okay? So, so this picture is when time is infinity, the, the final result, okay? The, this is new, the final target distribution. But in between, what happens is the following. So the region where eta t, eta t is the moving mass and nu t is the stopped mass. So you move, but certain mass is still moving, that's eta t and nu t is a stopped mass. So this moving part over here in the D1 case decreases. So in other words, the stopped part increases, okay? In this D1 case. And in D2 case, the moving part is the, the, this kind of excess of mass uh, here of above F and this one moves and this moving part expand over time. Okay, that's like a dynamical picture for this saturation. Okay. All right. And this is actually an important point uh, I'd like to make because that picture reminds us the, the familiar picture of ice, uh, water freezing and ice melting. Okay. So in this D1 case, so this, this blue part is like ice. So ice is, uh, so this water part becomes uh, uh, frozen. So the ice part increasing. So it's like uh, this, this process describes some kind of freezing uh, process. On the other hand, in the D2 case, this, uh, this red part where you have kind of warm water increase over time. So it expands. So this, so the, if the environment is ice, the ice is melting. Okay. Of course, this phenomena is related to the famous uh, Stefan problem in NPDE. So we actually have this connection to this Stefan problem, which has this PDE, the heat equation with free boundary. Okay. Where the free boundary changes over time, and this V gives the, the, the kind of speed how the free boundary uh, moves, okay? So, but in the freezing case, D1 case, the, the domain, the active region shrinks, and then the melting case, the active region expands. That's why we have these diff two different signs for this, uh, for B, okay? Yeah, please do not just try to read uh, everything in this slide. Just the point is that we have connection to this uh, step on problem, the free boundary problem in, in D1 and D2 cases, okay? We, and this free boundary problem is related to this you know, uh, I, uh, water freezing and ice melting uh, physical uh, situation. Okay. And this step on problem is famous problem in PDE and there are many works, especially in the melting case. There are many works, in particular, the, the, the very famous work of Kafari about the regularity of the free boundary and uh, other works like Asana Sokoros, Kafari Saisa, and Che Inon Kim, and also stability question by Hazik Skoro and Hazik Arafae. There are many works in the uh, melting case but in the D1 case, in the prediction problem, we found that there are only a few uh, results so far we have, but even those results are focused on very special case, like a radial case, radial symmetric case, or a 1D case. We have very few literature in the D1 case. Okay. But in our work, we consider both D1 and D2 case. Okay, but of course, I, I should uh, mention the breakthrough of Farelli, uh, I already mentioned, but of course, we have this recent breakthrough of Alessio with uh, Sarah and also Ton about the regularity of the free boundary of the Stefan problem. And also, I found that uh, Dipilipis uh, Sporau and Berchikov has another breakthrough uh, regarding uh, other types of free boundary problems. And I'm excited that they will all give a talk in this, uh, in this conference. Okay. Okay, so uh, I have two more slides. 
And so, okay, so from our uh, point of view, what can you say about the free boundary, for example? Okay, so remember the saturation. So uh, in the active region, the moving mass is like a characteristic function when F is constant. So the, the, the BB estimate for the, the measure can say something about the BB estimate for the actual active region, okay? Because the characteristic function, okay? So we can say something about the free boundary using, uh, by uh, analyzing the, 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 the mass, in this case, uh, uh, at, a, at a T or new T, okay? And we already had this BB estimate for, uh, for the, the target measure, optimal target measure new. So that's the case when time goes to infinity. We just look at the very end result and then we see that the BB estimate from uh, using our monotonous result, okay? But then what about the, 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 the finite time case? What about the, the intermediate case? Do we have some kind of estimate like this for intermediate time? Uh, so uh, estimate for uh, eta t, eta t or uh, nu t. Okay, that's a question. And in D2 case, we have such estimate, but somehow uh, uh, I think this seems to be already known in the literature for the melting case, okay? Such a BB estimate. But in the D1 case, uh, we could not handle uh, uh, using our technique. And I don't think uh, it is known in the D1 case either anyways, okay? But maybe the very last uh, piece of information I'd like to give is, a, is a, the next one. Okay, but we can still consider some kind of special case, but this is like a, the case when the, the source measure is like a star shaped, meaning you have a reference point and in each radial direction, the source measure uh, is decreasing. Okay, so, the, so each uh, super level set of the source measure is star shaped, okay? That's the situation. You can just consider source measure as the characteristic function over a star-shaped uh, region. Then that's a typical example you can consider. And in this case, the active region for each time, so this is the region where the, the oh, I'm sorry, this should be eta, it's not uh, rho. Uh, the eta, the moving mass is positive, okay? So that's active region. So in this picture, active region looks like at each time t, you take this, uh, I'm sorry, you take the time slice of this picture, then this slice in the active region is this active region at each time, okay? And if mu is radially decreasing or characteristic function over a, a star-shaped region, then this act, each time t, such an active region is also star-shaped. Uh, the, what this is about, I mean, just star shape, but you can actually say more than that. So you can consider this uh, uh, radial, uh, the, the radially decreasing uh, condition, not only one uh, reference point, but also family of points in a small ball. So you have a small ball and your, your, your initial distribution can be uh, radially decreasing for, from, for each point in that small ball. Okay, so under that condition, the corresponding active region AT is, is also, also star-shaped with respect to all the points in that same ball, okay? Because of this, but if the, but the star-shaped region having such a property has actually Lipschitz boundary. So, so because of that, if you had this uh, kind of a uh, radial decreasing uh, property with respect to a small ball, a ball, then you can prove that the corresponding uh, active region is Lipschitz. Okay? So we have certain Lipschitz regularity of the free boundary in this particular case. Okay, so I think uh, I say, uh, much of what I wanted to say. So here are some works in this direction with my collaborators. And uh, remember that the work with uh, Inwon Kim is, uh, joint, uh, is a work in progress. So hopefully we'll finish the work uh, within this month, but who knows, okay? And, and here, here are some other uh, papers in Martingale transport or some other conditions with uh, uh, 
for the, the problem, you can even add some drift for your process, then you can consider similar problems about optimally stopping uh, the stochastic process to, for the, to minimize certain cost. Okay, I think I, I'm slightly over time. I, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. All right, thank you, Yung Hyun. Um, so are, are, there, um, are there questions for Yung Hyun? I have uh, if yeah, no please. Uh, maybe I had a couple of one, right? So um, maybe in order. The first one is about saturation. So the, the formula you got in the saturation slides, um, rem, yeah, all these reminds me a lot also what you get like in optimal, the partial optimal transport, right? I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm wondering whether uh, you can you thought also a version where um, you know, not only you have a constraint of mu on mu, but also mu, then like mu less or equal than something, and then you impose a much mass to transport, which is really what to do in. Uh, actually, thank you very much. I, I, I haven't considered that, that, that question myself. Of course, yeah, certainly that is very uh, interesting question. Yeah, 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 thank you. Yeah. Yeah, of course, but, but I should mention that uh, the work of uh, Philip Santambrogio and Dipfilfis and Mesereles and Belchikov is kind of generalization of the partial transport problem too, in a way. Yeah. But they only have one constraint there, right? Yes. Well, well, in the partial transport, you have two there. Right. So I think what you did is really- That's right. Yeah. right. So, so that's very, a uh, very good question. Thank you, yeah. And uh, also later, uh, I like that. So you say that you can, um, you have these two free boundary problems, right? Uh, the forward, uh, I mean, melting and freezing, right? Yeah. Um, and for instance, you get these also these regularity estimates, like, um, so, uh, for instance, I was wondering, so you have, for instance, that Lipschitz estimate you got, uh, right, so it looks actually that we are improving the Lipschitz constant even, right? So it, it's like if you have a domain uh, which is Lipschitz in some way, I mean, of course this is very special, right? Because it's star-shaped, but there's really right. a monotonicity in, uh, right. so you do you, no, 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 you expect some regularization in fact, I mean, like in, in this particular, uh, you mean improving the Lipschitz constant after getting Lipschitzness? Right. I mean, in fact, here you proved that it improves in this gen global sense, right? Because I could just iterate. I could take the largest ball with respect to which I'm star shaped for each time, and you're proving that it inc this is increasing, right? So, in fact, in that global sense, you're you're improving that the Lipschitz constant in this global way is improving is Im improving even, right? I see. Uh, this is a similar spirit as like what we really did. Like once you have some kind of uh, cross to flatness, then you get can improve flatness. A similar spirit. right. But usually, once you are Lipschitz, you are you get higher regularity, right? In free boundary. So usually the difficulty is Lipschitz, and then you start right. There are, if you are Lipschitz, there are no singular points. You know these problems like uh, you know Caffarelli has singular points, which are like points where your free boundary has zero density. So it's very like fractal or strange. I see. But then when the free boundary is like thick, even if just, you know, even in a Lipschitz sense, then it actually is, an, is analytic. I see. Then, you know, you start. So you are suggesting that there should be a way to improve this Lipschitzness uh, once you have it. Right, I mean, uh, in one case, probably you can just rely on Caffarelli because I mean, once you are thick and uh, Lipschitz, uh, the Caffarelli tells you that every point is regular and then every point is analytic. I mean, it's uh, I see. In, in the classical uh, Stefan problem. So there are no... So th that is already known, I see. So yeah, yeah, that's exactly what... Is that, 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 uh, so this, especially this is interesting, uh, more interesting in T1 case the freezing mm -hmm. case. And we got this impression that the, 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 the existing literature is more about the D2 case when the free boundary expands. Uh, am I right? Or can we uh, apply those uh, regular features in, in both cases, when the, mm -hmm. especially when the, the, the active region uh, shrinks? I mean, it's not 
immediate probably but it doesn't look impossible to me because uh, the point the philosophy is that once you are lips so the, the sense once you're lipsis is like if you are in the you know measurable coefficient case and then you apply the georgia you are sick you are older and then you're, if you're older you're uh, you have shoulder right i mean in sense, the problem is to get these lip sheets and then you kick in because nothing can happen so uh, I, I don't know the literature for the other direction but it looks very reasonable that once you are lip sheets and so, you know, thick and nice, uh, you should get it by essentially elliptic regularity, then it becomes, mm -hmm. you don't really use that much. Um, you know, the, the point is that in the melting case, there is this connection to, also to the obstacle problem, that, but which helps a bit. But um, I mean, my impression would be that then you should get a smooth trend. So I mean- but the, the direction of free boundary movement uh, may not matter much. Yes. I think once you are thick and lip sheets, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think so, uh, but I see. that's- I, I never thought about that. So yeah, I think I, I look but, into but, it. But in the P2 case, yes. I mean, then you can apply Caffarelli in your analytic effect. Yeah, I see. That's great. Right, other questions? Very nice. All right. So um, let's see. There's a question in the chat. It says, in the freezing from Yumin Jang, in the freezing case, continuous solution might only exist for a short time, right? Can this method address the longest time that continuous solutions exist, the free boundary regularities for a short time? Uh, so, so continuity means continuity of what? Uh, eta? Or, actually, I don't, uh, or continuity of the, the free boundary. Uh, yes, I'm thinking about that. Continue to the free boundary, I mean the, the continue to the, of the defining function of the free boundary. Yes, continuity of the free boundary. Uh, the D1 case. Yeah. <laughs> I, so basically, uh, most of the thing we got out is out of this saturation and monotonicity. <laughs> so we have very simple uh, uh, tool. So in that case, yeah, of course the 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 star shape case, yes, because we have I just uh, mentioned the result, but in general, yeah, I I don't. Yeah, I, I have to think about. I mean, to say some, any anything uh, uh, meaningful. So there's also there something comment. written by yeah. Sorry. Yeah, there's also a comment from Inwon Kim in the chat. She says that for our setting, the initial data is well chosen since it takes out the instantly frozen set, so it is regularized in that way. Hmm. Uh, another uh, comment. I mean, this region, the instant uh, this uh, this inactive region. It's not clear how, how this region is actually determined. Well, it's not clear how this active region is determined. This is very uh, kind of uh, weird to me. So you can consider this mu like uh, without this tail, it's just uh, the, this, let's say, uh, on the support is F plus some positive one. So it looks like just steep here and then something above and then just steep, steeply going down, okay? Without this kind of a slope. In that case, it's like a characteristic function plus something positive. In that case, what happens, what should happen uh, from our picture is that you have immediate active region in an instant, okay? So you just hit, your heat just moves to the, the whole region within the active region and the shrinking stars. So somehow that, that process is a bit, uh, uh, it's hard to understand uh, intuitively why you know, we have that kind of thing. It's like uh, you have some kind of uh, a water, then the freezing starts something like a, a, a away from the, your support of water. 
actually, so young girl, this made me remind also an extra comment because the, the result I stated about Caffarelli, it has an assumption, which is that the free boundary moves. So like if you have highs inside water, there could be some, some time needed before the kind of move, the free boundary starts to move, starts to melt. Okay, in particular, if you start from a corner, so if you if the so if it's smooth, it remains smooth, but and it moves instantaneously because the velocity is determined by the normal and blah blah blah. Uh -huh. But if it's not smooth, it has a Lipschitz singularity. It could happen at the beginning that the free boundary doesn't move, so it doesn't melt, and then the singularity persists. But the moment it starts to move, then the elliptic regularity kicks in. So the moment uh, there is a split, any positive velocity then Lipschitz uh, free boundaries are analytic. So I just wanted to, you know, uh, I see. Yeah. To, make, to tell you this. Right? I, mean, I didn't want to say something incorrect. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is There's this, a this fact. There's a waiting time effect. Yeah. There's yes. a waiting time you effect. You mentioned this uh, uh, before because it makes me while we are discussing. Yeah, I, I'm not, you um, uh, know, should know uh, better uh, in uh, for those things uh, in this particular context. Uh, 